one here. We're here uh, with uh, my good friend, uh, longtime nutritionist and food expert, Patricia Greenberg. We're here to celebrate her fourth book. The book is called Eating Well, Living Well, and Aging Well. And uh, this, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Patricia before we begin here. Um, Patricia um, has been my friend for like 20, 20 years, years now. Yeah. I most known her because I've been, uh, she did a radio show for at least 10 years. Yes, yes. Um, she is the fitness gourmet. And I remember uh, the studios out in, by Cal State Northridge here in Southern California. And she used to have me on like every year to talk about what's new and exciting in produce. Um, in this little studio on this on the campus of Cal State Northridge there. But many of you know her because she's a food writer and a nutritionist fitness coach. I remember every time I've come over to the radio show, she was just getting back from Boston or just did the LA Marathon. This woman likes to run for some reason. So we'll probably hear about that later today there. But let me t give you a little bit of bio about Patricia and her books. Um, Ushering in a new era of bite-sized, livable health, nutrition, and fitness solutions, Patricia um, Greenberg, the fitness gourmet, has 30 years of experience as a nutritionist, chef, chef and wellness coach and educator. Still, um, still going strong at 59. She wanted you guys to know that. Uh, she lives a healthy lifestyle in an often chaotic consulting specializing in providing accurate nutrition and health information to today's consumer. So my guest today, we invite her back again since her last book about two years ago. Um, and I'm sure she has a big story to tell. Um, Patricia Greenberg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. You know, I... Um... I actually quit coffee and I switched over to organic decaf, so I bring my own little packets because it's one of the things that I always like to say, the stress component of aging well is critical for us to address. There's so many aspects to eating well, living well, and aging well, and we're all talking about it, right? It's all everybody is talking about right now is how do we age well? And there's a couple of trains of thought on that. One of them is how do we defy age? You know anti-age, do everything we can not to get older. That is not, that's impossible. There's no such thing as anti-aging. Um, there's healthy aging, there's happy aging, there's sad and angry aging, absolutely, but there really is no way to stop the clock. So what do we do? We want to maximize our lives every single day as we get older. There is a component to how long we're going to live, that's a mystery to all of us, and we know that. It's something that none of us has cracked that nut yet, where you can actually go and have an exam, and they'll tell you exactly how long you're going to live, what you're going to get, what you're not going to get. There's shysters out there telling you that, that that's possible, but it's not, as far as we know today. So the first thing I like to say, I'll give you a little bit of a background. How did I get here? Some of you asked me that earlier when we were having lunch. How did I get here? Okay, so I was a chubby, unathletic child. I grew up in a classic upper middle class suburban home in New York, and we just ate whatever was good at the time. My mother loved Swanson frozen dinners and whatever was coming out 1965 forward. I was born in 1960, so that, you know, those years were margarine, fast food, packaged food. My mother had five children in eight years, so I can't blame her. She needed to get everybody fed fast and easy. And we didn't have a consciousness about what we ate at all. Um, and I marvel at the young people now who do and either don't adhere to it or do and do adhere to it. So it's interesting to me now, the choices are endless and it's stunning to see what's available out there for us to get well. But do you know that only 1% of the American population really takes care of themselves? We live in California where we have, we see it, you know, it's right in front of us. I think it's too much in front of us sometimes. I think there's too much going on out there. Sometimes I have to take a, a social media break. I don't look like I do because I'm online a lot, but I do take breaks from looking at it. So the first thing is, because I could spend all afternoon with you talking about this, it's so near and dear to me. I got married at 37 and I had my daughter at 40. It took us a little while to have her. And I remember when I had her, 
I was at the height of my marathon training. I've run 20 marathons and 110 half marathons. Um, and I participate in the, thank you, thank you. When it comes out of my mouth, I don't believe I did it either. You know, when I hear my bio, I'm like, I didn't do that. And I got into competitive tower climbing. I don't know if you know what that is. People say, did you wear a harness on the Empire State Building? No, I climbed inside on the stairs. But it's actually a real sport. Um, I encourage you to go look it up. It's very interesting. Because yesterday was National St Climb the Stairs Day. And um, how that segues in, I'm going to talk about fitness more extensively later. I couldn't believe I could do these things. So I want you to know that you can do so much more than you think you can at any age. And my message to you is, as Robert said in the bio, is bite-sized solutions. I can tell you every little tiny step you take has reverberates into a really, really big positive change in your life. So I start out by saying every birthday, you know, we come up with something we're not going to do next year. Every New Year's Eve, we come up with, well, I'm not going to do this next year. Whatever your holiday or your line of demarcation is, and then we find ourselves doing it again. So I want you to get away from bad and good. I want you to get away from, get more into choices. Get away from, this isn't bad for me. I shouldn't be doing this. I'm going to steal a cookie off the tray when no one's looking. You don't have to steal cookies. It's okay to eat a cookie. You don't have to sneak, okay? And that's an unfortunate behavior that I see among people because everybody's feeling judged and squeezed and, 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 and uh, looked at. What are we doing? What are we eating? How are we taking care of ourselves? This is your path and your path alone. So you take on what you can and you leave the rest. I really feel very, very strongly about that. That will also, I hope, make you feel more relaxed inside that you're doing what's good for you at that time. Because paleo may not be good for you, but it might be good for someone else. Being gluten-free, um, having to be gluten-free comes from a condition called celiac disease, and that's the inability to process wheat in your digestive system. I have a very strong medical background in dietetics because I was a hospital dietitian early on in my career. That's how I started out in nutrition. And like I mentioned earlier, I was a chubby child. I wasn't paying attention to any of this. And I was going to school to be a dentist. And I was in pre-med. And in those days, women had to take a home ec course in order to graduate from college. Can anybody relate to that? <laughs> and um, yeah, you had to take home ec, one of them. So I said, I'll take the nutrition class and change my life. I switched my major, got straight A's. And, and here we are today, um, 30 some odd, 1985, however long ago that was. So uh, that's why I say I, I embarked on this journey, not only for myself, but I saw that this is, there's so many little things you can do and, and, and absorb it and feel good about it. So first I want to say, uh, it's a 10, there's 10 chapters, so I call it kind of the 10 steps to, to getting to where you can feel good about yourself about aging. And this is relevant if you're 30, I really believe this, if you're 60. I took a seminar Tuesday night. And they went around the room asking everybody, you know, what do you do? How old are you? Are you willing to tell us how old you are? This little tiny woman raises her hand and says, well, I go to the JCC. I swim five days a week. She's telling us all about what she does. And the facilitator said, how old are you? She says, oh, I'm 97. Like it was, and I was like, wow, I want to be 97 swimming five days a week and coming to seminars at night, right? No, people don't even want to go out at night anymore. Life begins when you start to live it. So where are you today? How old are you? How tall are you? What do you weigh? What medical conditions do you have? What limitations do you have? This is all you have to work with. It doesn't matter what you did 10 years ago. It doesn't matter what you did 20 years ago. You have to just be in today. My mantra is stay in today. I hope that's resonating with you in that um, what, what can we do today? It doesn't matter what you ate last night. It doesn't matter if you went out on a binge on New Year's Eve. What, what can we do today? without feeling like, oh, I was bad, now I have to fix it. No, you just have today. You woke up today, today, Thursday morning, June, January 9th, this is your, your new day. For, is that too corny from the 60s? Today's the first day of the rest of your life, remember that? That poster, right, that came out? So what's the physiology of aging? I urge every single one of you not to be afraid of the medical system. I know a lot of people in health and fitness think doctors don't know what they're doing, and hospitals are a place to die, and uh, tests aren't important. Western medicine teaches you everything you know about, about your body. It's up to you to take it and get treated or 
work on it in the way that you want to. So I urge every one of you, if you haven't been, I hope you're good about that, is getting annual physicals. Little tiny things tell tales. Now you heard my story about running, and I thought, oh, well, I'm immune to all the aging. I run marathons, I eat, well, I eat healthy. Of course I eat healthy, that's what I do. I have pretty severe hip arthritis now, so it causes me pain. And I disclose this with an open heart because nobody is immune to things that can happen with aging. Uh, menopause was killer for me. I'm still reeling from some of the effects of that. And I was told if you eat soy, you guys know I wrote two books on soy foods. I was the national spokesperson for the Soy Foods Association for years. Everyone says, eat soy, you won't have menopausal symptoms. Not true. Not everybody can evade it. Um, and there are versions of male menopause that men have issues with. So get yourself checked and see where you're at. The doctor tells you your cholesterol's high or your blood pressure's high. Do the research on how to work with that and take care of yourself. So that's my number one thing. Stay in today and take care of yourself. Physiology of aging, your body just slows down as you age. So you might be feeling something wrong with me, I'm tired. There's something wrong with me, I'm always hungry. There's something wrong with me, I don't feel like eating. I don't feel like exercising. A lot of these things are normal with age. So that is your clue to tell yourself, how do I want to eat? How much do I want to eat? And try to learn how to sort of self-regulate. And you've heard the term intuitive eating and learn about when you feel like eating and what's good for you. There's no hard and fast rules. Do you have the time and the energy and the wherewithal to sit down for breakfast, five, six hours later, sit down and have lunch, five or six hours later, sit down and have dinner? That's fantastic. If you don't, then this concept of eating small throughout the day, whatever works for you. But I urge you to sit down, take a deep breath, have a glass of water, get away from your desk, get away from your computer, and eat away from the stresses of the world. This ties in with, if you're eating healthy, but you're having problems in your digestion, these can create other issues for you. I don't mean this to be a downer. I just want you to be happy, is to take, take your lunch, step away from the things that are stressing you out, and you will feel so much better. Nutrition, okay. Everybody has their own idea of what's good nutrition, but there are some basics. And now we're in 2020, the year or the beginning of the decade of this new plant-based diet. Is this headline news to anybody that we should be eating plants? Right, it's kind of funny that now all of a sudden the new nutrition trend is to eat plants. We always should have been eating plants. So we hear the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of your diet should be fruits and vegetables and lots and lots of water. Yes, we know that's true, it does help for digestion. But again, this concept of having most of your diet come from fruits and vegetables is very sound. It's based in not just science, but culturally. Have you heard of the blue zones? Anybody here, the, several of you have heard of it? The blue zones are regions throughout the world. Dan Buettner was the author of this, and he partnered with National Geographic, and he went to the communities in the world that people live the longest. This is a very, very fascinating, groundbreaking longevity study. And what he found was Mediterranean, again, not headline news, but many of you may not know how the actual the regions broke down. In Sardinia and in a little enclave in Sicily, and I'm forgetting the name of the town, the men to be lived to be in their 90s and hundreds. There was a landmark study of a gentleman uh, who immigrated from Sicily to New York, and he lived on Long Island, my home, my home base. I'm from Oyster Bay, Long Island. And he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And he thought, you know what, I'm just gonna go back to my hometown. And he was in his 50s and went back to his hometown and he lived to be in his 90s. So it's multifaceted, the food, the best foods for longevity, Yes, fruits and vegetables, olive oil, staying away from processed foods, and not allowing your body to get too stressed. This is very much a non-food issue, but we still don't know the effect that stress has on our bodies, and that's why I encourage you to eat in a more quiet mode. Who just rep Someone reprimanded me for standing up while I was eating. I think you did. And it's true. I was standing up and eating, and I'm telling all of you not to do that. I felt a little rushed. So keep in mind that that's really the key, is to be kind to yourself. The first step is taking care of yourself. 
with other aspects of nutrition, I'm here. The new thing came out last year. Bananas are bad for you. Don't listen to it. Bananas are not bad for you. They're fine. If you don't like them, it's okay. If you feel full from them, that's okay. But bananas are not bad for you. What's bad for you is to eat food that you don't know where it comes from. You can't read the label. Again, this is not headline news, but it's so, so, so important to understand that these areas that were studied in the blue zones, not only are they eating a particularly plant-based diet with a little bit of fish, a little bit of meat, in Asian cultures, they live off of soy-based soy products, tempeh, tofu, soy milk, and edamame, the soybeans. Why can we eat edamame? Because they, they're picked prematurely, so they're softer. Soybeans, when brought to full maturity, are very hard, so that's where they extract the milk and make soy milk and tempeh and other proteins. And these cultures have found ways to preserve these foods throughout their, 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 their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren are following along with this. The other one is wine, scotch, alcohol. I like wine. My husband's a scotch aficionado, but... One glass of red wine a day is supposed to be the magic trick for preventing heart disease in both men and women. I think it's one for women, two for men. Um, I can't drink every single day. It doesn't work for me. I don't think you should either. There's a double-edged sword with alcohol. Uh, drinking alcohol has a relaxant effect, and of course it has the uh, anthocyanins and antioxidants in the grape that are very good for you. Also, wine and beer and scotch and drinking is a social activity. So I think, in general, it's OK not to excess. Now, this sounds so elementary and things that you're hearing all around, but I'm emphasizing again, what little steps are you taking in your life? If you never drank before, you don't have to take it up now. But these are little, little tiny steps in paying attention to how you feel when you eat. Okay, the intuitive aspect of it too. Do you feel really full after you eat? Do you not feel well? I had something the other day, we were out and I came home, the next morning my hands were swollen. So I know I had too much salt in my food. So these are things you wanna pay attention to. When you're in a restaurant and you're looking at the menu and you wanna order something you like, you have every right as a consumer to ask the waiter to leave something off or to make a substitute for you. Again, I don't want you to be afraid to stand up for yourself. That's another aspect of the wellness and taking care of yourself. Your doctors and other health practitioners may, may be telling you things you can and can't eat. And there are some real issues as you age. When you get into your 50s, you might have alterations in your thyroid. Um, you might have an alteration in your parathyroid. And that's why I, I really, really suggest that you get these tests done to take a look first. Cholesterol is a big mystery to all of us. Um, I have really high cholesterol. I'm one of five children. All of us had a spike at 40 and then another spike at 50. And many people will tell you that diet doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you eat. You're born, you're born with a predisposition to have high cholesterol, so I'm just going to take the pill. Not true in my case. And if you've been diagnosed with high, uh, high cholesterol, I encourage you to take a couple of months to try to get it down through your diet first before you take the medication. So every time I had a severe stress spike, my cholesterol went up and I cut out the egg yolks, yolk, hard cheeses, things that I seem to have been eating a lot and I got it right back down again. So that's just a little FYI about some conditions that can be treated through diet, even though you're being told that they're not. Just because your parents did not live long doesn't mean that you won't. So let's try not to be you know, if you are fatalistic, I get it, but I, so many people will say, well, you know, my, my parents got arthritis when they were in their 50s, and, or my father had heart disease, or my mother had cancer, and so I know that's going to happen to me. Not necessarily. And this is where good, plant-based, lots of fruits and vegetable diets are going to be very, very healthy for you. Roughage is very good, high-fiber diets. If you have digestive problems where the fiber diets are not working for you, there's other ways to get it into your body. So I would really suggest, too, that that's something that you play around with when you're eating. Um, in sharing with other people uh, nutrition advice, because many of you are nutritionists and people who work in well health and wellness fields, I mean, you know, what we're hearing now, again, is not just plant-based, but the high nutrient density and combining foods. 
I don't want you to lose sleep over any of that, okay? If you're eating a lot, you eat combined. Today we had um, several salads, eating a combination of fruits and vegetables with lots of color, so elementary. See, I'm never gonna make any money because I just tell everybody to eat fruits and vegetables and exercise. I'm not selling you any pills or, or magic powder um, to, to make, the, make the weight fly off. Weight is an interesting thing. Weight you do have predispositions to. And um, as we all know, it's not healthy to be too overweight. It's not healthy to be too underweight. But because of this cholesterol I had, I had a cardiology checkup. And the doctor told me people who are a little bit above their ideal body weight in the longevity studies actually last longer than people who are underweight because you have a little reserve to help you out. So that's going to segue into the fitness aspect. When it comes to aging, all roads lead to movement, okay? So what I did yesterday, because it was climb the stairs day, and I didn't quite feel like climbing the World Trade Center, so I went to my local park, and I just did some stairs up and down. Even with infirmity, it is the best cardiovascular exercise, and I really can tell you through all my research, uh, I am not a cardiologist, but I will tell you cardiovascular fitness will save you across the board in so many ways. As we know, you all should be weight training as well, okay? Don't lose sleep over it. You don't have to spend two hours in the gym. I recommend you do a little bit of your own housework. Do things around the house. Movement, movement, movement. You can take a can of beans in each hand and just walk up and down the stairs with the beans in your hand. And I'm really, I'm, I'm really not trying to be funny. Like I told you, I'll never make money because I'm, I'm not selling you anything. Um, but these little tiny things. Sometimes if you have mobility issues or for people who are confined to wheelchairs, I say take, do we have a dish towel here? Maybe I can grab a napkin or a dish towel. Or sh I'll show you some exercises that I teach people when they're seated. And uh, get to that point where you feel comfortable going walking. Again, these are mundane recommendations, but they really, really do help. The one thing I want to ask everybody, can you get out of the chair without holding the side of the chair? Okay. That's another critical, critical thing, is that when you are seated, you want it to be able to sit down in your chair without your hands and get up out of your chair without your hands. So I challenge you every day, if your bed's very high, do it in the dining room chair, just about 10 or 15 a day, sit in the chair, stand in the chair without pushing down. You cannot believe after a couple of weeks how you can strengthen your hips and your legs just from using your own body weight. Uh, arms up in the air, doing something like this. Take a break when you're, seat, when you're seated for a very long time. If you go and sit in lectures or seminars, even in the movies sometimes I get up and I just go to the aisle. My husband and I try to sit on the end and stand up and move a little bit, certainly on airplanes as well. Yes. Towels. Oh, yes. Okay, thank you. So what, um, what I like to show people, especially for those who are in the kitchen a lot, you know, you're feeling a little, you know, when you're leaning over food and cooking, after a while you start to really feel lower back, just up, down, up, down, side, side. You could do this in a chair. You could do it while you're standing. I have frozen shoulder for a year and a half. Does anyone know what that is? You just, you can't, you can't move your arm past here. So I was stuck here. Um, my mother-in-law was, she lived to be 101 and she was living in the house with us. She died on my husband's 70th birthday. Um, and so we had a lot of people in the house who lived to be long, lived to be old for a lot, lot of longevity. And she was very mobile up until very late. But she, when she was sitting down, we got her to do things that just helped move. The little, that little spike in your heart rate that even this can do, Rona, you know this from being a trainer, even if you're not running up and down the stairs or running a marathon, just little things like this, taking the towel and squeezing squeezing your grip, these kind of things will make you very, very, you'd be surprised how strong you can get in a very short period of time. Moving on, I wanna talk about something that is very near and dear to us in California is beauty and appearance as we age. Okay, what, what nutrition and fitness recommendations can we give you to feel better about how you look? You cannot stop time, okay? And when people say, well, what's the alternative? I don't want to get old. I feel bad about getting old. I'm angry that I'm, I'm getting old. Well, the alternatives are you could be happily aging. You could be, like I mentioned earlier, angry and sad aging, or worst case scenario, not aging at all. Not, not, not everybody has the privilege of making it to 60 and 70 and 80 and 90. 
I hope I live to be 120. That's my goal. I really do because I had my daughter late, so I want to make sure I see her when she's 60, 70, and 80. And um, so all these, like I said, these little things that with, your, with managing your appearance. The sun isn't bad for you. The sun is really good for you. Everybody's vitamin D, D deficient now, and it's all over the country. And what happens is you lay out in the sun without, I'm not encouraging this, but without sunscreen, and you let the sun in, and it converts in your skin into the vitamin D that you need for all your metabolic functioning, very important for the functioning of your heart. So how do, how do we manage that? Get out in the sun a little bit, get a little sun, protect your face, wear a hat. My doctor had recommended the back of my legs to get some sun. When I always run dressed like a mummy. I'm covered in long sleeves, pants, and a hat. And he said, you're not getting enough sun. So I've learned to love the sun in a way that I can use it for my health. Okay, and you will find now when you, everybody's getting these vitamin D supplements um, and after a certain age, I think they're manda becoming mandatory protocol is to take these vitamin D pills. But keep in mind, you can get a little bit of sun. I had a little uh, abnormal cells on my knee. I had them removed, so I'm very, very careful with that. Um, but there's too much, there can be too much overcaution. And I guess, I, again, I'm getting back to trying to relax your body. Managing your messes, okay? Um, this is way off the track of food and nutrition, but it's always something I like to incorporate into my, um, my speaking here, is if your life is messy, you will be internally messy. You won't be able to take care of the things that I'm encouraging you to do. So one of the things that I recommend going forward, we're hearing about, again, downsizing, cleaning up around you, is try to just keep what you need, not everything you want also, but what do you absolutely need? So I'm in this, um, in this transition phase myself. All the kids are gone. Uh, two moved out in one week, so that was horrifying. We ended up with nobody in the house. And um, I look around, it's like, what was I thinking when I bought that? And what was I thinking when I bought that? Because the house is so filled with stuff right now. And that really does, as you get older, that wreaks havoc on your brain. So I want to talk, I'm going to segue into brain health because brain health is a very important aspect of this also. It is really, really bad for you to multitask. We've all done this, right? Oh. And you look like a mess and you feel like a mess. And the truth is the matter is you don't accomplish anything. So what you want to do is one thing at a time if you can stay focused. My goal. I'm not big on New Year's Eve resolutions. I do it more on my birthday. My birthday is my, my, more my New Year's Eve. I got to get off the phone. I got to get away from the screen. I, it's important to me. Um, I, we, my family looks like one of those cartoons. And I even posted on Facebook, this is what you look like. You're, it's a, it's a, it's a um, handcuffed. You're handcuffed to your phone. What happens to your brain is when you multitask, which means you're doing too many things at one time, or you're worrying too much. So you're spending a lot of time worrying about things while you're trying to do something else. Um, the, you get, it goes a little haywire. And one thing we're finding, I, am, I got trained as a dementia friends um, presenter through Alzheimer's LA. And I, extend, I studied this extensively, which is going to bring us back to diet. All right, many of you may get AARP. Um, magazine. Um, you can go look at it online. The cure for everything is the anti-inflammatory diet. The cure for everything is a catch-all term. You ate a completely anti-inflammatory diet today because I hopefully you had a little bit of everything, right, rather than too much of one thing. I don't know that the Oprah and scones are, uh, if you had four or five of them, that's anti-inflammatory, but here's what happens. Inflammation makes its way into your body in ways that you don't even know it's there. You don't have to appear thin, heavy, but you know when you feel swollen, right? What, regardless. And what does that do to you when you wake up in the morning and you feel swollen? It ruins your day, right? You don't feel well. You don't feel as sharp. You don't feel clear. And you don't feel confident. It's like oh, it just has this feeling on you that, that wreaks havoc in your everyday life. So here's how it starts. Inflammation is wonderful when you have something wrong. So if you get a cut, you break a, worse break something, and it swells, right? That's what inflammation is. It, it inflames. All the antibodies come and try to cure it. When you're under extreme stress or you're eating too much food for your body size, you're overeating, 
you're over drinking, you're under fit or unfit maybe is the right way, that your cardiovascular system is not working at full capacity, your body swells in result. Because what you're doing to your body that's not good for you, you have an inflammatory response in the same way that you're having an injury. So if you're eating a lot of junk food and you're not exercising, your cardiovascular system responds by swelling and becoming inflamed. How do we reverse that? What do we do with that? Inflammatory is a, um, it's, a, uh, it's a response to your body that you can't will away. You can't say to yourself, okay, I'm going to take a deep breath now and calm my anxiety. Inflammation response doesn't respond to that. You have to really take the time to recalibrate your body. Here's what happens in your brain. The same way that we have the inflammation, the inflammatory response in our heart and our, dig our digestive system, when your digestive system inflames, that's when you start to get the irritable bowel syndrome, colon cancer, all these things that are very scary and very hard to talk about, but they're in response as well. In the brain, the inflammatory response, why do we hear that you can have a stroke if your cholesterol is high or you have blood problems? For this reason is it inflames. And what we're finding with Alzheimer's now is if we can keep the inflammatory response down, we can keep the memory stable for longer. And I want you to also understand that there are five types of dementia. Alzheimer's is only just one of them. There's a vascular dementia that comes, it's like a second cousin to cardiovascular disease. And if you treat the cardiovascular disease, inflammation will come down in the brain. So what do we want to do? What are the key? inflammatory foods. You're hearing about turmeric. I'm I, the turmeric industry a lot because my husband goes to Trader Joe's and he buys five bottles because it's $1.99 a piece. Omelets, soup, fish, whatever I make, he's got a whole jar of, of turmeric on it. Turmeric and black pepper, cocoa, and like I mentioned earlier, red wine, vegetables. Particularly, I made red um, the purple cabbage, the red cabbage, braised cabbage, that's one of the number one anti-inflammatory foods that you can be eating now. So if you get a chance, uh, there's a big section on it in the book. If you get a chance to look up on AARP or you've got the, um, this would have been from, uh, I want to say November or December if you keep them around. It's the anti-inflammatory diet. So you don't go on a diet, just pay attention to eating the inflammatory foods. When you get the menus today, you'll see the majority of those items are anti-inflammatory. Celery became the big trend. People were drinking celery. Throw it in your food. You know, throw, I, I make tuna fish. When I make tuna fish, I put in olive oil, red onions, and celery. That's my crunch. Um, I don't put uh, mayonnaise and I don't put salt. I don't put salt in anything. I have a salt sensitivity. So people say to me, oh, I got to put a little salt on it. Be my guest. I just don't put it in there for my preservation. Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts are fantastic. Very high fiber, rich in color, as you know. But the purple and red category is fantastic for anti-inflammation. Lastly, we're all here as a community, and some of you have, I always say you knew me before I needed to wear glasses, right? That's how long, I know Faye and Yak here probably 30 years since I moved to LA. And as these things go, yes, you can eat carrots and lots of vitamin A to keep it going. Remember, it, it plays a role in the whole entire body. Wear your glasses. Wear your hearing aids. Put on your orthotics in your shoes if you're having trouble walking. And get help and ask for help. The community we have here is beautiful. I encourage all of you to reach out to each other. Whatever the, the, the aspect of aging that you're concerned about, if you're feeling someone, I promise you you're not alone in anything you're feeling. It's important to reach out and ask for help. I like to share all this information with my food friends, other than speaking engagements, about you know what are you having? What are you having tonight for dinner? So what I keep in my house, um, my husband calls it bowel evacuation soup. So at the, um, it's usually I try to do it on a Sunday because if I'm traveling or I'm working, and Aaron and I are apart, I need to leave him food in the house. So I take broccoli, cali cauliflower, uh, any kind of bean, cat, whatever's in my house, celery, onions. This is stuff everybody has in their kitchen. This isn't stuff you have to go out and buy. Spinach, I try to get it right before it's gonna turn so it won't make the batch go bad. 
and I pour it in with some tomato sauce and I let it simmer, I kid you not, four hours, five hours on a low heat on the stove. And so it, it can even sometimes just cook down to almost like a gravy consistency. I can put it on pasta, I can put it on chicken, I can put it on tofu, I can put it on vegetables um, and just, or eat it as a soup. The other thing I keep in my house, are a lot of you vegan? Many of you vegan, not everybody, you guys are vegan. For the non-vegans, what I do is put a pot of um, hard-boiled eggs in my refrigerator so you always have a protein available to you. It's, if you, if this is not right in front of you and not available, um, I'm speaking probably more to your audiences than, than you in particular, um, that it's there and easy to eat with or without the yolk. Um, if you're vegan, um, again, I can't say enough about soybeans. I know it got a bad rap, but the combination of beans and whole grains, I buy sprouted, uh, sprouted wheat of any kind, quinoa, again, old school, and things are being debunked every year and brought back and brought, so just stick with, stick with the old, you know, we all, we all can be old school now. I, I always say, once you reach 55, you can say whatever you want. You can eat the way you want. It's, it's your prerogative. You, you've earned it. Um, so those are the things that I say is that keep things in your house that are already cooked and ready to go and reach out to your community, particularly a community of fr food friends, because everybody's hearing what's going on and what people are doing. Um, and from there, you have a springboard. Eat with other people. If you can, don't eat alone. If you live alone, try to get out and be with other people. Um, I think social media is reaching a point where it's almost making us more lonely in some ways because we're relying on the information that's there. Pick up the phone. One of my best friends passed away on Friday. He was 59. And I've known him since I'm four years old. And he had Parkinson's disease. And uh, I come from a, a town that has clusters of neurological diseases. I'm sure you've heard about these and read about these. There's cancer clusters. Um, five kids on one block near me all have MS. So there's obviously a trend in, in neurological problems. And lupus was another one. And he didn't ask for it. You know, he didn't do anything to himself to get it. These things happen. And we haven't cracked that nut yet of... How can we cure all diseases with food? But one thing across the board that every single medical professional and people working in these, even the alternative physicians will tell you, and the Western traditional will tell you, eating a diet that's the majority is plant-based, getting some form of exercise and movement, and being part of a community have shown people live much longer with these conditions that we once thought were completely uncurable, untreatable, and unapproachable. My last thought to you, is how am I doing on time? Okay, yeah. My last thought to you before we get to the Q&A is that please don't be afraid of aging. It's a wonderful gift, and you may not like every aspect of it, but if you can plow through and enjoy where you are today, stay in today, be in day by day, hour by hour, or minute by minute, if that's what it takes, for you to embrace the happiness, when you reach that point, you will make better choices on every level of your life. If you feel better about where you're at and you feel calm and serene, you'll make better food choices. You'll make better medical choices. You'll make better relationship choices. You'll make better financial choices. And as you get older, share this with everyone you know. And I have learned in all of the studies, I, it took me 18 and a half years to write this book because it started when I had Gabriella. So I'm gonna circle back. I had my daughter. I felt fantastic. I was running marathons. I was working on the radio show, uh, traveling around the country, doing all kinds of things, writing books and so forth. It didn't occur to me I was aging along with everyone else because people say, you're 40 now. You can't be running around in spandex pants. And uh, you're, then, you know, 10 years later, you're 50. You know, I really don't think you should be running anymore. It's really bad for your body. And um, so I had to come to terms with what I was being told, even though um, I consider myself a health professional, to what the reality was for me. So all my friends that are my age is who I go to. Your peers are your best advisors. I try to surround myself, not all the time. I mean, I like my daughter's friends too, but teenagers are hard, uh, having a lot of teenagers around. I like to go to my friends. Hey, are you going through this? Are you feeling this? Is this happening? I was diagnosed with blah, blah, blah. 
Is there any, you know, do you know anybody else that has it that I can talk to? That is showing to be one of the best avenues of taking care of yourself because you're feeling better and knowing you're not alone. So there we are. Thank you.